When did AIOs get so expensive? They're like, I remember like back in the day, you could get like a top tier liquid cooler for like a hundred bucks, maybe 120, right? But, but since then, like a 240 millimeter AIO is going for like 150, 200, even $250. Why? Is it really just because they started slapping on LCD screens that you can customize or fancy RGB fans that look pretty? I, I just don't understand. Like, hear me out. If, if you actually compared the cheapest AAO on the market to the most expensive one, would the difference in thermals and noise, you know, the things that actually matter in a liquid cooler, warrant the massive price gap? <sighs> That's what we're gonna find out today. Before we continue, thanks to CD Key Offer for sponsoring this video. Hello, fellow kids. It's back to school season, which means you're probably sad and angry right now. To help quell the anguish of your return to institutionalized education, CD Key Offer is having a back to school sale on software keys, including global lifetime keys for Windows 10 Pro. Right now, they're even letting you stack my offer code on top of their offer. Use code BW20 at checkout for an additional discount and snag a legit Windows 10 key for just 16 bucks. Afterwards, simply view and copy the key you just purchased, paste it into the Windows activation page, and presto. Enjoy every feature Windows 10 has to offer, ditch the watermark, and even use it for a free upgrade to Windows 11. CDKeyOffer.com is also having a back-to-school physical sale on gear like mechanical keyboards, gaming headsets, RGB decor, and more. Remember kids, just because you're going back to school doesn't mean you can't leverage this awful time in your life to your benefit. By the way, you don't need to be a student to take advantage of any of these deals, so congratulations! Everything sucks a lot less for you. Check out the links in the description below and start browsing all of the limited time deals on CDKeyOffer.com. So for this little showdown, I decided to go with 240 millimeter AIOs just because they're a bit more compatible with most cases. There's more rad support as opposed to for 360s. So I felt like it would be a little bit more relevant for, for those of you who are watching. But in case you're curious, the most expensive AIO, regardless of radiator size, I looked it up. It's the ASUS ROG Strix Ryujin 2 360 millimeter AIO, and it's currently retailing for $360. That is disgusting. Who the hell's buying this thing? Anyway, I'm getting very distracted right now. Well, let's talk about the coolers that I did buy. These 200 140 millimeter AIOs, starting with the cheapest option, which is the id cooling. Is it id cooling or id cooling? I've never actually figured that out. Anyway, we'll call it id cooling, the Frostflow X240. And it looks fine. I mean, we'll open up the box to see if it's falling apart or if it just looks like total crap. At least on the box, of course, it looks all right. And this was $55, 55 USD versus the Corsair H100i Elite LCD. I purchased this for $240 and it was the most expensive 240 millimeter AIO at the time of filming. $55, $240. Why? Why? Even if the quality of this one is infinitely better than this one, and this one just keeps dying or whatever, you have to keep replacing it, you could still buy four of these and it would still be cheaper than buying a single unit of the H100i Elite LCD. Now, if I was a betting man, I would bet that the Corsair cooler is cooler and quieter than the Frostflow here. Now, I'm not knocking people for their purchases. Anyone who bought this, if you're happy with it, that's all that matters. Maybe you bought it because you love Corsair products or it matched really well with the rest of your system, or you really love the RGB fans, or you know, you just had to have that custom cat gif running on your cooler at all times. Whatever the case may be, you are perfectly valid in your purchase. But for anyone else out there who solely cares about performance when it comes to cooling and noise, this is the video for you. And for the record, I'm not bashing on these fans just because they have RGB. These are supposed to be good fans. These are maglev. These are some of the best fans that Corsair currently offers, which is why after we do the initial test of each cooler, how they perform right out of the box, I'm gonna do a fan swap. I'm gonna put these fans on that cooler, these fans on that radiator, and we're gonna test it again because I also wanna see how much of the cooling performance of a high-end AIO like this is due to the fans versus everything else, like the cold plate or the pump or the micro fins, the tubing, the radiator, and that, and that sort of thing. Obviously, we can't test all those things individually, but we can test the fans after the first test with everything running stock. All right, before I install these guys, I wanted to do a quick side-by-side -side comparison, just really quick and dirty, uh, comparing the two coolers right out of the box. So we've got the id cooler, the, uh, the Frostflow X240 there, and then the H100i uh, LCD Elite, or whatever the hell it's called. For starters, the radiators between the two are very identical. Obviously the same uh, 240 length. By the way, I just realized this is $240 for a 240 millimeter radiator. That's a dollar a millimeter. Nah, she broke. 
I'm up. But they're the exact same thickness, 25 millimeters, same thickness as the fans, and uh, they look very similar. They're not exactly the same though, like the, the indents on the uh, the ends, they're a little bit deeper on the Corsair radiator, but not, not that that really affects anything, it's just a, a cosmetic thing. But just, just so you know, they're slightly different, but very similar. The radiator fins look exactly the same between the two as well. Uh, they're both aluminum, and it looks like they have the same density, so not really many changes there. Tubing on the Frost Flow is a little bit thicker than on the Corsair. I would say maybe by a millimeter or two, in diameter, but it's, it's not much, but it is there. You can tell it's a little bit thicker. And then we also have the uh, the pump blocks. So the pump blocks, I actually took a close look at both of the copper plates. For the record, uh, the Corsair does come uh, included with pre-applied thermal paste, whereas you actually get a tube of thermal paste on the Frost Flow, which I actually kind of prefer. There's pros and cons here, right? I know a lot of new builders appreciate the pre-applied uh, thermal paste just because it's easier and quicker, but a lot of enthusiasts also like to provide their own or actually uh, have a tube included with, with the AIO that they can apply themselves. In some cases, you can see a slight thermal improvement it's usually not a whole lot, but you know, teach their own. The Frost Flow uses a ceramic pump, and I would assume that the Corsair one does as well, but it's not listed anywhere on the box. And here's another thing to point out. Look at look at how these box, look at the marketing on each of these boxes. This is the Corsair cooler. Everything that they're saying, all the marketing stuff, is all about the LCD. Like that's that's it. It's just a little bit of text here just showing you like what's included or whatever. And the rest of it is just marketing the RGB and the LCD screens. Like look at all the cool stuff you can put on there. Look, it's a cat with glasses. Isn't that awesome? Give us money. Whereas on id Cooling's product, you actually get some relatively useful useful specs, like what kind of pump it is, the speed, the noise level, all the fan specs in terms of CS CFM. You don't even get that. You don't, there's no CFM. There's nothing here about the fans. Obviously, marketing is marketing, and you know, you're going to have to verify all this to make sure that the manufacturer is testing it properly. They're not making false claims and all that. But even a chart like this still gives you a way better idea of the product that you're buying as opposed to whatever this is. Plus, the fact that Corsair is really only advertising aesthetics and features as opposed to actual performance leads me to believe that that's where most of the cost and premium comes from, which, again, is what we're about to test. And yeah, obviously Corsair is going to win by a landslide in the features department here with this LCD screen as well as, you know, the RGB uh, fans and stuff. You can put some useful information on here, CPU temps, pump speed, and all that jazz. This is just a, this is just a pump block. You know, it's got a little white LED on it. It's not even RGB. I don't know if you can call that alone a sacrifice with this cooler since it's four times less expensive than this one. So we'll get to that, all that stuff in a second. But here are the fans on the Corsair. They got rubber pads on both sides to reduce noise and vibration. There are two cables coming off of each fan, a four pin PWM and a cable for for RGB, which connects to this uh, controller here. That's another thing about uh, the fancier RGB coolers. They, they always have a lot more wires to connect. Obviously having a controller hub like this helps with wiring a lot, but you still have to put this thing somewhere. It's pretty chonky compared to like not having something like this at all. You gotta find a good place for it, somewhere it fits, and then you've got two more cables coming off of this. So it's just cables on cables on cable. Cableception, not to mention all of the, the cables coming off of the actual pump block. This looks like freaking, this looks like a power supply, a bunch of power supply cables. There's so many cables here. You get one, one cable, one SATA coming off of the id cooler. And this is one area where a super high-end AIO could never outdo a budget AIO, which is simplicity. This is a lot more like, I can install this in a fraction of the time. Fraction, literal fraction of the time it would take to install this guy. All the freaking wires and cable, what is this? What is this? The Frost Flow fans have no RGB on them. They're just, they're just fans. They just do the cooling. They do the, the actual job that you need them to do. They do have four pin PWM, so you're not sacrificing anything there. And I think they look good. Uh, I know we're not really talking about aesthetics much in this video, but for the record, I personally feel like the super high gloss stickers on these Corsair fans cheapen the appearance a lot more than the matte finish on these fans. I know that's highly subjective, but I just gotta throw it out there. Here's a quick look at our testing system and the overall setup that we have. You can see I already have, uh, for starters, I've already installed the the uh, Flow, fl fl Frosty Flow, fl Frost Flow X. That's on top of a Ryzen 9 5900X. It's running stock. It's got 24 threads, so that's definitely gonna push both of these AIOs. Uh, we didn't wanna use like, a, you know, a mid-range or an entry-level CPU because it just wouldn't tax uh, the coolers enough. But 5900X should be golden there. Motherboard is an ASRock B550 Phantom Gaming 4 AC. We've got 16 gigs of G-Skill uh, Flare X memory. Our GPU is the NVIDIA RTX 3080 FE, Founders Edition, running stock. We are actually gonna test out GPU thermals. So basically the radiator fans are gonna be responsible not just for cooling the CPU, but also for all of the system's intake because those are the only two intake fans that I've configured here. So I'm gonna look at GPU temperatures in uh, amidst these tests just to see how effective each cooler's fans are at providing general airflow 
to the rest of the components. You can't see the M.2 SSD because it's mounted directly behind the GPU, but it's the crucial P5 Plus, or I'm sorry, it's the non plus. So it's uh, Gen 3, PCIe Gen 3. Uh, it is an NVMe drive and it's a one terabyte, I believe. Um, clean install of Windows. Just installed Windows a few minutes ago. You can see I'm already, I've got, I've got to install some games here, Cyberpunk and Red Dead, which are the two titles that we'll be testing. Um, but it's a, it's a clean install, so we shouldn't have any kind of background applications or anything funky interfering with our tests, throwing off our data. Power supply is a Corsair RM750, so 750 watts, 80 plus gold. The case that we're using is the Fantex Eclipse G360A. It's a fairly new chassis, and one of the reasons I picked it is because it has really good airflow at the front. It's using Fantex's patented super fine mesh. I think that's what they call it, super fine, ultra fine, whatever. But that's definitely gonna help our fans to breathe well, and it's gonna keep us from having any kind of airflow bottlenecks throughout our testing. And uh, I also fitted the case with two, uh, I almost said Corsair, Noctua. These are Noctua NFF12 fans. There's just two of them right there, 120 millimeters. I'm gonna go ahead and let the games finish downloading so I can run all of the tests between both coolers, as well as doing the fan swap that I mentioned earlier, and then I'll circle back with the results. All right, the results are in, and they are pretty telling. We're gonna go over everything uh, right now, but first, sound test. Uh, we're gonna start with that. Actually, the best way to do it is just to let you guys listen. Uh, here you go. So as you could probably hear, the fans on the Frost Flow are a bit higher pitched than the Corsair fans, but that's not to say that they're a whole lot louder. They are a bit louder, maybe a couple, by a couple decibels higher at most, but uh, it, they're fairly comparable. They just have very different noise profiles. Personally, I prefer the lower pitch sound of the Corsair fans, but there is an unexpected perk to the, the id cooling fans being a touch louder. There's a bit of wine. There's a bit of like fan wine on my RTX 3080 FE that's in there. And personally, I find that sound a lot more annoying than any of the fans here. And you can actually hear the whine a lot more on the H100i because the fans are a little bit quieter, whereas the fans on the Frost Flow pretty much drown most of that sound out. In fact, I didn't even really hear any whine until I swapped over to the uh, uh, the H100i. And I was like, what the hell how is that whine? Oh, it's, it's the 3080. It's been there the whole time. I just couldn't hear it with the id cooler. Thermals, all right. So the ambient temp in my room that I tested in, which was this room, I was 24 C, 24 degrees Celsius. And uh, I'm gonna be presenting the maximum temperatures on our CPU, as well as the average temps, because I feel like maximum temp is, is often an outlier. That's not super representative of overall thermal readings. You definitely get a fair comparison when you're not just looking at the one thermal spike that each cooler produced. Starting with the idle temps, the Frost Flow X uh, with the stock fans just straight out of the box, I got a max CPU temperature of 34 degrees Celsius and an average CPU temp of 34. But when we slapped the Corsair ML120 fans onto that cooler, we saw the max and average temp drop by two degrees. So it's a small difference, but it's measurable. Um, and then when we switched over to the H100i Elite LCD with its stock fans, we didn't really see too much of a difference between that and uh, the Frost Flow with, with those same Corsair fans. This could be just because we're idling here, we're not really putting, we're not putting any sort of thermal load on it. Let's see what happens when we go to Cinebench. I ran the multi-threaded test so we could put a load on all the cores and threads, and this was actually kind of interesting. You can see that our, our max temp uh, for the Frost Flow X was 72C, average temp was 66, but when we slapped the Corsair fans onto it, we did drop our maximum CPU temp by uh, three degrees, but as you can see, our average CPU temp was actually three degrees lower than the Corsair H100i which doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. At first glance, it's possible to say, well, maybe the Frost Flow X is just a better cooler overall. Fans aside, maybe it has a better pump or you know, a better cold plate, things like that. But uh, looking at the results, later on, we'll see that that's not the case. I think what's really happening here is that the Cinebench run is just too short. I mean, the 5900X does this test in about 30 seconds, which you know is a thermal load, but it, I don't think it's long enough for, for us to really get a long-term and thus more accurate result. At this point, you know the, uh, the, the, the CPU isn't being heat soaked at all. And so it's possible that the H100i is initially slower to perform than the Frost Flow, but over time, it could th very well catch up and even surpass it which we're about to see. Cyberpunk 2077, this is the built-in benchmark. Uh, I ran it at 4K, max settings across the board, 
And this is uh, still a short benchmark run, but it's notably longer than, than the Cinebench run that we just did. And here we can see the H100i taking a more definitive lead. We still knock off a few degrees by slapping those Corsair fans onto the frost flow, but once we're just using the H100i out of the box with those same Corsair fans, those maglevs, uh, we're dropping a whole five degrees on average. Okay, so yeah, the H100i is five degrees cooler than the $55 AIO. I don't know if that's exactly worth the 330 36% price hike. It's worth noting that Cyberpunk is a super CPU intensive title. Uh, the average temperatures here were actually significantly higher than they were in the Red Dead Redemption 2 test, uh, which had a much longer duration. And we'll look at that right now. Um, this was tested at 4K as well, just like Cyberpunk, max settings. And this was our, like I said, our longest running test here with a duration of 15 minutes, which is plenty of time for the CPU to get uh, fully warmed up, uh, as well as the GPU. Here you can see the Frostflow X with its stock fans got an average CPU temp of 57 degrees Celsius. Once we put the Corsair fans on it, it dropped three degrees to 54C, and the H100i takes the lead yet again at 52C. But this indicates that you can buy the absolute cheapest AIO, slap on a couple high-end fans, and get within two degrees C of the most expensive AIO that you can buy, um, which is, stupid. And even if you were to do that, if you were to upgrade the Frostflow X with, you know, a couple high-end fans that were 25 bucks a pop, that's still only $105 that you'd be spending versus the, again, 240 bucks of, of the Corsair cooler. Uh, and then this is the one test that I, I also documented the GPU temps just because it was a long enough run, again, uh, allowing the GPU to get heat soaked. So here the stock Frostflow X got an average GPU temp of 74C. With the Corsair fans, it dropped one degree to 73, and the H100i got a lovely 69C. Um, that's, again, a five degree drop. It seems very consistent and repeatable. While those are measurable gains, those aren't really significant when you're talking about the price difference between these two coolers. I think it's interesting that there's exactly a five degree difference between both coolers for both the CPU and GPU. I think that's relevant to the scenario that we have here, which is, uh, you know, we have the AIO radiator at the front of the case, so those radiator fans are essentially acting as intakes as well. And basically, the hotter the CPU gets, the warmer the air from the front of the case is gonna be because it's dissipating more heat through the, the fin stack of the radiator, and it's gonna do a less effective job of cooling down the other components in your build, like the graphics card. Uh, in a nutshell, the Corsair cooler, yes, the H100i, it, it looks cooler. It's got RG, well, I guess that's subjective but you know it's supposed to look cooler in theory it's got you know some nifty features some cool features there's some extra functionality within the IQ software but if you're looking at this from solely a performance perspective I it would be ludicrous to recommend the h100i at least at its current price you know if the Corsair cooler knocked off 10 15 even 20 degrees then the narrative today would be different but this demonstrates the extreme cost of aesthetics and features that have somehow infiltrated the CLC market over the last few years, and uh, I don't like it. That's the conclusion of, of all of this data is I, I don't like it. That's gonna do it for this one, guys. That, that's all I got. So let me know what you think down in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching this video. As always, toss a like if you enjoyed it. Get subscribed for more tech content on the way, and I'll see y'all in the next video.